Welcome to GamerCast. My name is Rob McCallum. With me this week, as always, is Jay Bartlett. We're the duo behind the NES Club and producing this technological marvel is Glenn Sandway, another person who's in the NES Club film. This week, we're going to be talking about the broadest of all topics that concerns the film itself and goes well beyond what we were able to cover, and that's collecting. Before we get to that, I just have a quick few updates on what is going on with the film. First, just want to say hi to all our new members that we've got via Twitter and Facebook. Um, we've run a Facebook ad and a Twitter kind of blitz and just been inundated with lots of new highs. And thank you. So cool to have so many more members. And that's led to a bunch of new podcast interviews happening. So you'll hear that. We're very close to finishing. Uh, we got one major shoot left, of course. Uh, we have a live event coming up April 6th in which Jay will be in Waterloo, Ontario for a video game swap. So go check that out, Waterloo, Ontario. Meet Jay, say hi, shake his hand, get a poster, whatever you need to do. And uh, we are starting to think about screenings for this uh, massive undertaking that is almost a year in the making. So if you want the NES Club to a town near you, please reach out to your local theater and see if you can work any deals. Sponsorship is always nice, but basically it's got to make financial sense for us to kind of come there. We'd love to take it anywhere, but we need all the help we can. After all, we are independent filmmakers. So with all the business out of the way... I open up the mics, guys, collecting. What are your initial thoughts when you hear that? I've got a bunch of stuff to talk about, maybe at a different kind of approach than most people think. But Jay, Jay, what's the first thing that jumps into your mind when you think about collecting? Oh, man. The first thing that pops into my mind, um, it's a never-ending quest, being with video games or anything else you collect. Um... You find a great piece you've been looking for for years, and there's always another one right after. So it's just it's never ending, which I think is is a good thing. Yeah, it's definitely the fun part about it because then it's like, uh, in some respects, you control when it's over, and there are a lot of factors for people. Um, Glenn, I think off the air you were talking about how collecting for you has altered in the past to how you maybe collect now. So. Why don't you bring everybody up to speed on how collecting has changed for you or the way that you approach that subject, whether it's games or anything else? Sure. Yeah, I I used to hang on to games for a really long time. And uh, at some point that just like it, it just become it just became stuff. And I, I was OK with not necessarily having it around anymore. So for me, in terms of games, at least, uh, it's really become more about the, you know, if I have a way to have that experience, I don't necessarily need to have that kind of physical tangible product i'm okay especially with a game just experiencing it through you know whether that's virtual console whether or not it's uh it's steam like just getting a, a chance to play the, the the product is good enough for me without having to have that you know the marketing or the the packaging and the manuals and all that stuff but i i think if i'm being honest with myself i, I think we all could we all collect to some degree uh, sure it's degrees right i mean there's some people for whom it's really it really is a hobby or, or almost like kind of a full-time thing. And then there's other people who do it a little more casually. I mean, uh, I keep buying guitars at random for no real reason. <laughs> other than the <laughs> fact that I like guitars. And I tell myself that I need them. So, But I, I'm also not what I would consider to be a guitar collector. You know, I'm not going out and finding, you know, ancient, really, really valuable guitars. Like for me, it's just about... That can get expensive. That yeah, yeah. For crazy. me, it's just about the selection and having some options open and the fact that they, you know, they all do sound a little different from one another and, and so on and so forth. So do you have a problem with emulators? Do you use emulators or if you wanted to play say earthbound, would I wouldn't you... have a problem doing it, but I don't, I don't play anything presently using emulators. So, so like for me, like I have earthbound on virtual console on Wii U. Mm -hmm. Um, just like I know what I've done lately with console stuff is, uh, uh, I'll give you a good example. Bioshock Infinite, one of my favorite games last year, bought it at fifty nine ninety nine. That's Canadian retail for all of our American listeners. Uh, back when it came out at the beginning of uh, last year, uh, played it, really thoroughly enjoyed it, uh, played it through, finished it, trade it, get some credit back for it against something else, and then buy it again for nine ninety nine on a Steam sale during Boxing Week. And now I've got that as kind of like my permanent purchase of it for lack of a better way of putting it i can download it on any machine i want install it play it um and i find myself doing that a lot now too so what, one of the things you, you mentioned there that i know i don't i don't think i've really thought about it 
and Jay, maybe maybe you have. I, I think I kind of know my answer is, I don't know that I count a digital library of something as as a collection. I mean, we have iTunes and we have our music collection now in digital form. And that seems to be kind of normal for music. But for some reason, a collection to me immediately signifies a physical presence. I don't know if that's right or wrong, but I don't know. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer for that, Rob. I think, I mean, if you're paying money for anything, it's a collection, whether it's on a hard drive or not. You and I both think, you know, going into someone's house and seeing the bookshelves of games and movies or whatever, that's always been far more impressive than someone bringing up their computer or laptop and showing you, oh, look at the hundred files of NES games I have. It's just like, yeah, well. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I think, too, like you, you were talking about music, Rob, but you're going to meet a lot of really, really serious music fans who are going to debate you on the notion that digital music constitutes a collection, too. Well, that, well, that's what I mean. It's like we look at our iTunes, I think, en masse, because everybody seems to have an iTunes or some sort of digital music library but not a lot of people have a digital game library because it isn't quite the norm yet for a lot of people to have pretty much a 90 percent digital music library see i wonder i wonder if it's just honestly if it's our generation we're just old school because i have zero problem paying eight bucks a month for netflix I, I, i don't mind that but the notion of buying a movie off itunes for 12.99 and you just click a button and you don't get anything right I just I have a really difficult time doing that. Yeah, I mean, Netflix feels like a very disposable thing, and that's almost kind of like the purpose of it, right? It's like I'm paying you ten bucks a month. It's kind of a kind of a grab bag selection at any given point. I'm not really attached to anything, but when you make that additional, like you're saying, twelve dollar purchase, now you feel like you got to get something out of it. Um, you know, as a filmmaker. I kind of lump music and film into the same kind of category where it's more of a passive experience. I know we all play musical instruments, so Mm -hmm. music has a little bit of a different effect for, you know, guys like us because we can actually play it and have an active role in it. But games are definitely an active role for the most part, cinematic discussions aside. You know, you're having an active experience for something where film and music, you're kind of just sitting back and passively being entertained. So I wonder if that plays into it. The, the the Wii a couple of years ago started releasing arcade games, which was really cool. That was something I actually didn't know they did because I hadn't been on online with my Wii for quite a while. And they had like Ninja Gate in the arcade game, and I think it was only previously ever released on the uh, Atari Lynx portable. So I picked that up. Stuff that you can't get on anything else, I will pay for if that's the only way I can get it. But if there had sure. been like... Beside the links, besides the links version, if there was a hard copy of the Ninja Gaiden arcade game, say on Genesis or whatever, I would go and hunt that, hands down. So, Glenn, you you bring up a, a kind of a, a big point for a lot of collectors. It, it kind of hit me on I don't know when you first start collecting. For me, it's like you're excited and you're kind of hunting and hunting and getting and getting, and then all of a sudden there's a space issue. You know, so now you got to be a little bit more selective. No doubt, man. You know, you you can't just buy a bunch of guitars, for example, because not only are they really expensive, but you're going to run out of space and where you can put these things. So maybe Jay and Glenn, what do you guys think about quality versus quantity? And at what point does space become an issue for your collection? Well, you see, for me, um, I live on my own. So, I mean, really, the whole the whole place is to myself. Um I think you know me well enough, Rob. Well, if there's not space, I will make space. I've never come to a point where I haven't had room for something. So I hope I don't get to that point, but I'm I'm good so far. <laughs> so for the rest of the world, Glenn, I'm sure you and I can relate on this because I'm married and I have a very distinct uh, zone. It feels like the quarantine zone that, you know, it's my little space and heaven forbid uh, I should ever expand beyond, you know, the cautionary tape that. Oh, you mean you for, for the normal people? Okay, I got you. I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Glenn, I mean, I think you and I are a little bit more on the same page here. For those of um, us with women in our lives full time. And Gosh. Uh, I, th- I think that's just a coincidence. Maybe, yeah. maybe that's just a coincidence. So, uh, yeah, and, and, and. I can think of many instances of that around my house too, and it, it's I'm I'm very very lucky in that uh, I have a partner who's very very 
supportive of my my geek culture needs um and she's got a lot of really great little collectibles herself and as it stands right now we have a couple of display cases downstairs where we have you know some of her more you know our, our more favorite pieces or uh or, or more valued kind of possessions uh there's going to be a point at which there are going to be children in our house and that stuff is just not going to be able to be there anymore so sure so this answer might change in the near future but i i can already think of uh so many instances where I've had to kind of downsize. Um, I'm a comic reader. Uh, a lot of my a lot of my collectibles, any of the collectibles I do have, are, are comic related. Uh, but I I have literally boxes of hundreds and hundreds of comics I've collected over my life, which do not see the light of day anymore. They're literally in a closet until I can find something to do with them. And I've really switched to digital at this point. I don't buy uh, actual paper books very much anymore. I'll buy the odd. A graphic novel or trade paperback if it's something I'm really, really fond of. But uh, most of my stuff is digital at this point. And I literally have a portable hard drive just full of digital comic books because I just don't have the room for them. Uh, but I want to be able to go in and, and grab something at random and read it when I want to read it. Um, yeah. I collect... Uh, we already discussed the guitars. I, I, I wouldn't call myself a collector again, but I do... Uh, uh, I do uh, buy the odd uh, Transformers figure, too. Uh, I'm a big Transformers fan. And really, my my solution to the problem of space is that generally I buy something if it's certain characters. If there's a new figure or there's a new, you know, there's a you know an item or a statue or a collectible or something like that, I'll go out and I'll grab that for certain characters. But I I have to be able to say uh, no at some point. Like I'm looking around Jay's room right now, and he's got like every Star Wars figure ever made, and and clearly just kind of buys whatever he can get his hands on. I'm missing a few. He's missing a few. <laughs> you wouldn't know it from looking at the wall, but uh, I, I just I just can't do that. So for me, it's like you know, if there's a new Prime or a Star Scream or a Grimlock, yeah, I'm all over it. But I, I have to kind of be choosy in terms of what. Yeah, I, do. I mean, I, I completely understand. I've almost infamously now had to sell pretty much my entire He-Man Masters of the Universe collection to help pay for the film. I've got a few figures here left in Vegas, but I was in the same boat as you, Glenn. Most of my collection was up in Canada. I live in Vegas now, so it's kind of in a box in the dark. I get to see it once or twice a year when I head up there. So it's like, man, can I put this space to better use or put this collection to better use? And the film was a little bit better use, in my opinion. And I got to tell you, you know, an NES cart, a Genesis cart, a Dreamcast disc is a lot smaller than an action figure that has to kind of be, you know, either displayed or or set up in, in a specific way. But you guys have brought up Something else that's kind of interesting, I think, about collecting. When do we actually realize that we're starting to collect? You know, do we make active decisions, say, I am going to collect? In the film, Jay, obviously, you know, you set out to get a complete collection, but I don't know that everybody says, I'm a collector, I'm going to collect this. I think sometimes we fall backwards into it. I mean, what was your experience? When did you realize you were a collector? And what do you think about others? Oh, that's real easy. That was... When I was becoming a teen and I, I started working, uh, my first job, and I remember uh, me and my my buddy Skyler, we worked, we were dishwashers, and we would work two weeks, and our whole paycheck was just enough to buy an NES game, and I remember I bought Mega Man 3 with my first check, and it was around the time that game stores were starting to pop up everywhere, and some were taking used games. And I remember it came up, and it was just like, Skylar was like, well, why don't you take some of your old games, trade them in, and knock down the price on some of the new ones. I'm like, well, I don't want to get rid of the old ones. So I think very early on, maybe 13 or 14, um, besides the Star Wars stuff, I'm just talking game-related stuff, I didn't want to let go of anything. I mean, most of my stuff, my old stuff, is still from when I was a kid, right? I just, I never wanted to part with any of it. It's like a good book. It's like a good movie. You want to revisit that, right? And especially with the yeah. pr- the prices today, I don't want to have to go and find some of the stuff I have again. So, and, and I think one of the more memorable lines of the film, and maybe it'll be in a second trailer if we ever get around to doing that, is that we we talk about how every game that you collect has its own story, like the one I just told. You're exactly right. There you go. So Mega Man Three has that history now. Yep. You know, and you can't. I mean, you you can't get that history by, I don't know, maybe buying it on eBay or something like that. And it's, I don't think you can get that history when you make a digital purchase. Unless you're saving up for a lot of money and then you're like, man, I worked, you know, my entire check to get this digital version, I guess. But, I don't know. eBay is good if you, if you don't have a lot of time uh, to go out and search for something. 
and you just want it instantly. That's what eBay is good for. And 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 I think like Rob, further to the point you just made, uh, that's where that's where for games I'm able to kind of draw the line. And to me, it's yeah, like I I don't need to have the memory associated with that game. I I am content to have the experience of playing through it. Like every time I play through Super Metroid, I don't care what format it's in. I have that experience all over again of playing through that game and those feelings that I have when I'm playing that game and that that isolation that that game does so well. And that's why I always find myself coming back to it over and over again. And I I don't. I don't need to think about the first time I played it or or what the you know what the story was behind it. Like for me it's enough to just experience the you know the the game as it is. Sure, but it was, wouldn't it be cool if you had a story to go along with that? Like don't you remember the first time you got Super Metroid? And sure you can't replicate it and you're going to go back and play it in different forms, but getting that game for your birthday or Christmas or finding it where you never thought you would or you were with your buddies and something else major happened that weekend. It's like, oh, yeah, that's also the weekend I got that. I mean, the NES Club is full of those kind of stories when people see the film. But, you know, just... just And there's no right or wrong answer, Glenn. I mean, it, sometimes the game is just enough and that maybe takes precedent over the experience, you know? Yeah, I, I think... I don't know. I find myself thinking about museums as well, and and <clears throat> museums really are just collections, right? They're 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 sure. We don't necessarily think of them as collections in the traditional sense that we'd think about collecting, but they that's what they refer to them as. You know, you work in the museum industry, you're talking about the collection that your museum has, and I'm okay. Uh, you know, I can go to the Royal Ontario Museum uh, once every you know few years, which is about as often as I ever get to anymore. Um, and I, I know I've got favorite things in that collection or I've got certain areas of that museum that I like to revisit and I love being able to go and visit them. And it's a, it's a new story for me every time I'm going and I'm seeing that particular part of the museum. But at the same time, I don't really feel compelled to take that home with me. If that makes any sense. And, and no, cause it's, cause it's always there. So I get it. It's like, I don't have the space that Jay has in his place as we've talked about but it's really cool for me to go there and experience every room being thematically different it's almost like going to a museum this is the star wars room this is the nintendo room this is you know whatever it's really cool to have that experience and that's a story in itself how, how do i still get girls let me ask you that I, <laughs> well I, I if you can that get question. them that far i mean <laughs> i mean you're talking about theme rooms in my house here and they still come in it's it's a miracle is what it is. These are not like adult well, themed rooms either. I mean, that's an interesting point that you bring up. And I don't, you know, you, you bring it up as a joke, but it's like the collections are a reflection of who we are. And, you know, if I can play, you know, Dr. Love here for a second, I think it's kind of a, a show of confidence when you can say this is who I am, you know, love it or don't. You know, you don't hide. You don't try to pretend. I've had way too much. I've heard way too many stories where it's like, you know, moving moving in with the girl Got, got to get rid of all my collection and, and whatever. And there's absolutely no way in hell that's ever going to happen. So whoever I end up with. God, God bless you, buddy. Because when you get to the restricted zone like Glenn and I have, where you're on shared space, it isn't a pleasant no, thing. No, no, no. There'll, there'll definitely be a shared space. I'm not saying that. I, I fully realize that. Just imagine you had to take half your, half your house right now and get, get rid of it. Because now you're sharing a house. Because that's what you do. I don't want to think about that. <laughs> what about the Star Wars room? What about the game room? Not that... anymore. <laughs> It'll just become an adult Star Wars room. There's there'll be the the Leia bikini set aside for your significant oh. other. And... <laughs> Dude, it'll that, be, it'll so be like Jabba's palace theme room. And that's your... that's Luke's sister, man. Don't talk about her like that. So, Glenn, you, you you bring up the idea of going to museums and stuff like that, and thinking that in terms of them as a collection. Maybe Jay and I, and I don't want to speak on behalf of Jay too much, but I kind of foresee how I do my collection. I set it up as if it was on display, like a museum. I mean, you look around Jay's place now, clearly the stuff is out to be seen. Yeah. And everybody will do their things differently and stuff. Like Jay and I, you have talked, you and I have talked extensively about how everybody likes to do their own different thing. What do you guys think about setting up your collection for display purposes or, you know, you keep things hidden. What do you guys think about the whole museum and the house aspect to collecting? Well, Rob, I'm all for it. Let me just tell you that. <laughs> I think um, on our trip, we saw a lot of different ways that collections are displayed. Yeah. Some weird ones and, you know, some kind of normal ones. But I'm of the opinion that they should be enjoyed. I think the stuff should be out. 
There's nothing wrong with putting it in boxes or any of that stuff. I just prefer it out. I want to see it every day. I mean, I've never ever wanted the traditional house with the nature paintings and the wallpaper and all that. I don't want to look at that stuff. I want to look at, you know, Star Wars posters and I want to look at video games and it's just the way I've always envisioned it. So that's the way it is. And I come back to uh, I come back to what you were saying earlier, Rob, about your Masters of the Universe stuff and how most of it was sitting in a box up in Canada and you very yeah. rarely saw it. Yeah. And and the question that came to my mind when you were saying that is, well, you know, how much how much enjoyment are you possibly getting out of that when it's sitting in a box in another country? Well, that's what made it easier for me to let go. Like I'd go there and because it was the house I grew up in, there's all this nostalgia, the stories yeah. behind the figures are with the figures, but I don't live there anymore. There's no right or wrong way to do it, though. Remember, Rob, the, yeah. the one collector literally had all his stuff in a vault. And yeah. he enjoyed showing us the pieces of his collection one at a time because he got the different reactions he pulled out this game, then that one, and each one was better than the last. And we're like, oh, ah, oh, ah. Whereas this is like you kind of come in and you take a few minutes to, you know, ingest it all. I think it's really interesting that the lengths to which people go to have their collection housed, whether it's on full display or like the gentleman you're talking about who literally had a vault, like a 3,000 degree fire yeah. safe, and where he held most of his collection, which include complete sets of Genesis and Sega and Atari and NES for the most part and other stuff. He built that separate room and waterproofed it and... And all this stuff, but you would never know because it's kind of like a cave of wonders. You would have to know that it's there to know what's behind that door. You know, other collectors we talked to have like completely redone their entire basement with custom shelves and glass cases that they've searched everywhere for to have, you know, Nintendo, you know, World of Nintendo or Atari, you know, twenty six hundred type stuff. Yeah. Jay, I mean, yeah. I don't think I'm giving anything away. You acquired a bunch of NES carts in the film, and you bought some shelves to help house all the new carts that you've got. So, again, the collection is impacting your entire life now. I mean, what, what do you think about that when the collection gets so big that now you're changing things around to just, you know, maintain it? If, if I may speak about... Um, you may? Speak on our... <laughs> our our, our good buddy Sid Bolton and we went to sure. his, his house and uh, he's got a pretty big house and like he has a, a video game history museum not he has a, a back house in the back with all the computer stuff not that part but his actual house the bottom floor every single room is video games and that's that's what I see happening I think it's great I, I would want to live in that space eventually with enough games to be surrounded by it i would want to look at that every day that's just me though right i i just i guess i'm what i'm what i'm trying to get at and i totally agree i would love to have like custom shelves and just yeah, constantly, awesome. literally surrounded by memorabilia or games and stuff but once you really get into it and you start adding it up it can cost a lot of money to display these games take care of these games maintain them and you know alter the space in which they should be you know Small example, NES box protectors. You know, you can get the plastic ones that are like a buck each. You can get the acrylic ones that are like $50 each for the actual carts. You know, so this stuff can really add up. And of course, the argument is, are you going to pay a couple hundred dollars for a single plastic game, but you're not going to pay a dollar for the plastic box to go around to it or whatever? To protect it forever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or the shelves that it should go on rather than just a stack in a corner or like, you know, a plastic bin somewhere the the acrylic ones aren't those crazy overpriced like seriously but they're cool though i mean they're, they're really cool, overpriced yeah. but but they're uv protected too i mean so these are all things you yeah. don't think about but when you've got the 200 hundred dollar game you're like oh cool it's on display in the sunlight all day long i better protect this thing right yeah, otherwise exactly. it's gonna be dime store frank miller so um it, there's just so much to talk about collecting. I've got a whole bunch of other topics here, guys. What do we think about this? This is a little controversial. I've seen more than one post online about this. Um, collectors as hoarders. Well, um, how so? Well, I mean, there are a lot of people out there that maybe do have excess money. I certainly not one of them, but they will go out to stores and buy like everything. And now because they can afford 
to buy this game and that game and that game and that game. And maybe they have doubles of it. And now they're the ones with 10 copies of this or 15 copies of that. That's driving the price up. They're hoarding all those games for themselves. Does it matter? Is this is this well, complaint legit? Should should we as collectors care that somebody has the means to buy that just because we don't? Well, I, I certainly am not one of those people. Um, I'm all for upgrading the game. Let's talk about like NES games, for instance. You know, you get a rare game like Samson or Panic Restaurant. Um, you're lucky enough just to find it, and maybe it's got a tear on it. You still buy it. A couple years down the road, you, you find one that's in better shape. I'm all for upgrading, you know, taking the old one and maybe trading it in towards the one with the, the better label. Um, I guess I would ask those people what the end goal is. If you're talking about like a high price game, like, I don't know, again, like Samson or like stadium events or something like that. Um, well, okay. Let me throw, let me throw this at you then. Yeah. I don't think this is on the same level, but I think the psychology is the same. I'm a little bit of a DuckTales fan, as you know, big fan of the NES version. They recently released the HD version that just came out on, I guess now previous gen consoles. PS3, uh, Xbox 360. I have, of course, the NES version. I have the empty digital-only PS3 case still sealed. And I have a sealed copy of the actual physical game for PS3, 360, and Wii U all unopened. Is that excessive? Maybe it's not hoarding, but is that excessive? Is that a problem? There's no right or wrong answer for that. I I really believe... You should be able to do what you want without being looked at or judged. If you if you want to get five copies just because it makes you happy, then do it. You know, what I was just going to say earlier, I guess, about if the, if there's people going out there hoarding these very expensive titles, I guess, you know, you have the right to do what you want. Like, who cares? Just think, if, if it makes you happy, do it. What drives me nuts is less the idea of people hoarding stuff. Like, like the example you're giving, Rob, you're a really, really big fan of the product. And you want to, you you know, you have one of everything because you want to have the product and you're planning on keeping that product and that's your product, right? Like that's, that's stuff that you are keeping for your own, you know, personal enjoyment or, or personal reasons. And I think there's a difference between doing something like that. And what drives me nuts is people who buy stuff for the sole purpose of reselling it and trying to uh, jack the price up. That's a different thing. And yeah. I'll say, like, again, coming back well, to... Well, let's me, talk about that. Yeah, Go ahead, Glenn. Come, let's come, talk about reselling. Coming back to my Transformers collecting... Um, there is uh, Takara in Japan, who is the uh, the company that originated Transformers and Hasbro uh, licenses certain figures and reproduces them over here. Um, they make uh, a series of figures known as Masterpiece Transformers figures, and they're like really, really, really high-end Transformers figures that are they're designed to kind of replicate the look of the characters from the show a little bit more than maybe the original toys did. They have really, really, really involved transformation processes, and these things are anywhere from usually about 80 bucks to you know, $100, $120, depending on the figure and the size and, and the materials and stuff like that. And they will occasionally bring those figures over to the U.S. Um, and they're available in really, really limited quantities. And I cannot tell you how much it drives me crazy if I'm looking for a specific figure, and I know it came out, and I can't find it anywhere, but I go on to Kijiji or eBay, and people are reselling open box or, or non-open box, like like still sealed Figures for you know double the cost of what the thing sell for at retail. That absolutely drives me mad, and I felt the same way about. Uh, I'm a former game store employee, and you saw people doing that with the, you know, the PS3 back when it launched, um, the Wii back when they were still very very difficult to get. I mean, to some degree, the Xbox One and the PS3 as well, and just that whole that whole notion of scalping something just because the opportunity's there. Uh, makes me absolutely bonkers, and and it doesn't just extend to collecting. I mean, you know, people to this day still do it with concert tickets and sports events, right? But it, that doesn't make me like it anymore. <laughs> and and to me, there's a difference between buying multiples of something because you want them for your own personal use or for your benefit, and that's money you're investing into that, and taking away the opportunity for somebody else to have something, or forcing them to have to get it at a premium because you're a greedy jerk. Jay, Jay, what do you think? I mean, I definitely think that there is some overlap between a collector who is trying to sell you something and a reseller who has a large collection. And there's definitely a complete different attitude when you're approached by either person A or person B. And again, as we keep saying, you know, there's no right or wrong. 
But what are your thoughts to resellers? And maybe this is a little bit more in the online world, other than when we meet people in person, it's like, well, this is what it goes for online. You know, that's a famous excuse. What do you think about resellers and people that buy stuff just for reselling, Jay? Not a fan. Not a fan at all. Um, I think it hurts the community. It hurts collecting in general. Um, it jacks the prices up of these games unnecessarily. Um, I think if you want to have three copies of Little Samson for your collection, you have absolutely every right to do that. But I don't like these people that go out to find Little Samson, pick it up, and then flip it for profit. Some people well, may I'll, disagree I'll, and say they're just making a living. I personally don't agree with it because I think it really hurts the community. I'll, I'll play the other side of the coin then. Uh, if I find Little Samson, a game that I do have, for $5 somewhere, because I'm lucky enough that somebody didn't realize what they had, you know, I am probably going to sell that. I'm not going to try to make somebody bleed. I hope it goes to a good collector who's been looking for it. Yeah. But I will sell it if I get it for five bucks and I can get 500 for it to get the next collectible that I really want, then that's what I'm going to do. I, I think that's a little different. We came across a few situations like that in the film where I found yeah. a couple of really great titles that I already acquired. So I picked them up for future trades with vendors and, you know, people we met and such. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think if it's going towards the cause and towards the collection and back into the community, that's fine. But I think when you when you find it and then you're you're charging thousands of dollars for it and you have absolutely not a care in the world about what the game's about or the history of the game or anything, I think it just really hurts the community. That's I really think that. So this comes up to something else that we talked about in the film, and it and it's one of my favorite parts. Um, there's a little bit of it in the trailer, but let's not give too much away. And this is a term that I guess I kind of came up with on the spot, Jay. Collecting karma. Yeah. Yeah, so may, maybe let's talk about the concept of collecting karma. You know, what what do you think collecting karma is? Does it exist? Does it help you for future collecting hunts? I don't know. Talk about it. Well, I mean, it's karma, right? So it, it exists. I, I Does think, it? I, I, <laughs> Does it? Let's why, talk why about that. Why is it given that the karma exists? <laughs> do you believe well, first in, the, in all, the notion first, of karma? First of all, John Lennon says so, and that's all you need to know. So, <laughs> um, I think just doing... There's an unspoken etiquette, I think, with collectors. And I think... And you have it. And I have it. I, I would think I do. I think, I think I'm a kind collector. I'm a generous soul. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't really know how to answer that. That's kind of, that's kind of a tough one. I think if you do something crappy to somebody, it's going to come back and get you no matter what it is. I really do believe that. What do you think? <laughs> oh man. Uh, it's a tough God. one, Rob. That's a tough one. It's, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think, I think the best you can ever do in life is try to treat other people with respect and, and try to be fair with other people and I think that goes for this as well as anything else in life it's it's you know there are no guarantees in life I mean you can't I don't think anybody should ever set out to do something for the notion that they're going to get a payoff later on because it's you know somehow you know there's going to be some sort of positive outcome because they chose to you know quote unquote do the right thing I mean you do the right thing because you do the right thing all right hypothetical situation just one, one right. sec I've actually had this happen where I was I was at uh, at one of the flea markets I go to all the time, one of the booths there, and I saw said game, and it had the price tag on it, and you know I said to the clerk, okay, I want to grab whatever it is, Darkwing Duck, let's say, and there was actually a dude behind me, and he upped it by five bucks, and so then I matched it, and then he upped it by ten, and I was like, forget this, and the clerk actually sold it to him, so I think that's crappy karma right there. That's what whatever happened to co to the whole phrase first come first serve? No, but it's just like that's just a that's a, a nasty thing to do to somebody. Sure. It's none of your so, concern right now. Like I'm interacting with the person. I I I was there first. I'm interested in the title, and then he comes in and swoops in with more money. And I was just like, oh, crap. That that's kind of the the scenario that I was gonna throw at you guys. Let's say that money. You guys only have call it fifty dollars each. Okay, you it's and pretty another accurate, actually. <laughs> You and an you and a rival collector. I'm sorry, Glenn. You and a rival collector show up at you know the local game store. 
you get there at exactly the same time for the, exactly the same game. I murder him. That's How, the answer, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I How hard do you push the shopkeep to get you know get him to sell you the game? At what point, you know, do you just say, you know what, give it to him? It does the does the other guy have to like complain enough, and you just you're sick of hearing it? Do you give up right away, or do you? How much do you state your case? Apparently, Jay, the why should for I sell Jay this game $10. to you? Here's the deal. Here's the deal. I've got the game, guys. You know, you guys make your case. Jay, you're one gamer. Glenn's the other gamer. I'm the shopkeep. Okay, I absolutely, obviously love video games, so I don't mean anything when I say this, but I would feel embarrassed. If it was going to get to that point, to be honest, I would just, if the guy was going to have like a fit about it, you know, I'm not going to like whine over a game. I'd say, Jay, Jay I, I don't think you've got the point here. Right now, you're not convincing me to sell you the game. Glenn, all you got to do is give me any kind of reason and the game is yours. What game is it? What game is it? What game is it? What if I just wait, wiggle my fingers in the universal sign of I've got money? I'm pretty much ready to ring you up nice. unless Jay can give me a good reason to sell him the game. You should sell me the game because I'm a nice guy. Hey, Glenn gets yeah. the game. Hey. <laughs> hey, Glenn's the big winner. <laughs> Any Glenn will do. Any Glenn will do. Well, that was some fun role playing. This, I don't this, like your role playing. Uh, this is where crap. I find out that it's like, I don't know, Bram Stoker's Dracula for SNES oh. or something. Oh, that's your business. I didn't that's the, the game, game you wanted, and that's the game you bought. Dear God. Congratulations. Um, what do we think, I guess, about the used market? Obviously, for collectors and people that, you know, are looking for titles, the used market is, is like, a huge place to go. Like, how do we feel about this game is worth, again, we'll say 50 bucks, but when we go to bring it into a store, we get $5 for it. Well, it's a little bit of the reseller thing again, but this is the market in place. I mean... They're, they're people trying to make money. It's a business, right? You know, they're just making money. I think if it's that low, if they're you know buying it for five and selling it for forty, that's a little crazy. But at the end of the the end of the day, they're just trying to make money, right? They're they're making their living out of selling used games. So, I mean, if you go in there with NHL fourteen that you spent fifty nine dollars on and you expect to get fifty dollars back. Well, then you should do your research because that's not really how the world works, right? I mean, you're not going to get... You're lucky if you get half of that. Why Why is that fair, though? Well, they have to make money. It's like when you drive the car off the lot when it's brand new, right? It's no longer but, new. But how much money is fair? I can't answer that. I don't know. Um, depends. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of things. A lot of things to take into consideration. Like how many copies they have of the game, how new the game is. You know, you got somebody who brings in Modern Warfare 2 that there was 10 trillion of them printed. And, you know, he has 80,000 of them in the back already. He's not going to offer you 30 bucks. He's going to give you like a dollar, if that. Do you know what I but mean? But, Jay, it's a classic game. There, were, There's a lot of Mario 3 carts out there. There's a lot of Legend of Zelda carts out there. Okay, hold on. Because this is... Yeah. You can't compare Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 to Super Mario 3. I'm sorry. I think I just did. I'm sorry. I think I just did. The Call of Duty games, as great as they are, unfortunately seem to have a shelf life each year. So, aren't uh, aren't gold Zelda cartridges worth tens of thousands of dollars? That's what I sometimes heard. That's in what the right was market, my understanding. Sometimes in the right market, they can go for upwards of thirty thousand dollars. Wow! The right market Ooh. is somebody's attic in whatever random location. You're you're of course referencing uh, a, a quote from me in a, in a recent interview that played into the film, dude. Where I, somebody, I, I can't wait till you see the movie. I'm really excited to see the you movie, being actually. Glenn because this. I don't even know if this is going to be in 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 the cut or not, but there's footage of it. These people were absolutely crazy. They were crazy, and it was. Rob and I were looking at each other, and we were looking at the the, the crew, and we didn't think we were going to get out of the house alive. It was like Devil's Rejects. It was like a Breaking Bad moment where once the door locked, you like there was possibly no escape. Like you didn't know what was going to happen behind closed doors. They had all their games laid out on the table, and they wanted my my opinion on what they were worth. And I told them what they were worth, and they didn't like the answer. They thought because Zelda was gold, it was worth thousands of dollars. I'm like, no, not even close. When we when we pulled up eBay auctions to show them comparable prices, I believe one of the family members, and I'll use the term loosely, 
uh, left the room and slammed the back door, apparently disgusted with Jay's appraisal. Oh, he was and, mad. Yeah, he was mad, yeah. and that's when it that's when it got uncomfortable. I'm like, okay. I was almost toying with the idea of buying one just so, you know, we get out of there alive. I got a the question. The blow. I got a question for you. Okay. So let's go back to little Samson, which, you know, loose is worth about five to 800 for the sure. NTSC one. Oh, shit. I don't like where this is going. Now, I want to I ask you this because we were talking about this the other night for almost two hours. Do you think that game is worth that much money? I mean, I think it's worth whatever you want to pay for it. I think the general consensus right now, the market has decided, like you said, that game is worth five to $800 because there are only so many in existence. The game is actually good. So that also helps jump up the price. Game's very but the good, demand yeah. is there. Yeah. You know, the demand is there and that's all that matters. There are other things that help, you know, create that demand, like low print, uh, hype, the, the trend. It's like... Samson is one of those titles for the NES that, oh man, that's a hot title. So that, you know, jacks the price up. And you, if you go on like a site like pricecharting.com, you can see the trend of that game going up, you know, in, within like the last three years. It's just like an exponential curve almost because it's a hot and talked about game. I just Some I th- games go up and down because they drop out of public consciousness. I hear a lot lately... Uh, and this is no disrespect to anyone in particular, but I hear a lot lately from the collecting community that, uh, you know, don't pay a lot for, for these games. And and it's just, it's weird to me. It's like, yeah, obviously that's a very expensive title, but like you said, one, it's extremely rare. Uh, two, there wasn't a lot made. And three, the game is like 20 some odd years old. I mean, these we're talking antiques now. If you want it and you have the means... What difference does it make? Exactly. I mean, I'm not saying that I feel comfortable paying a three-digit figure for any video game, but if I want it and I have the means, who's to say that's not right? Like when I mean, I don't. I should try to scour Facebook to see if I can find some of those you know, posts or whatever from the collecting community that you're talking about. But I don't know if this is the right thing to say or not. But I feel like a lot of those people that say such things maybe are just a little upset that. They don't have the means. I mean, because why else would you say something like that? I don't know. I think, unfortunately, long gone are the days when you find games like that, you know, out in garage sales and flea markets, like once in a while. But, I mean, I'm just judging from me. Well, this go- goes back to this I just, goes back to our quality versus quantity. I'm going back to, or I'm going from my experiences from going out on the weekends and and and, and shooting with you with the film. It sure. was it was pretty pretty slim that we found games like that that the people didn't know what they had. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it has a title on it, and there's a thing called the internet. I was gonna say. Some say the internet's a fad. Yeah. The Some say the internet there, won't no. last. I think it's here but to because stay. the product has a title on it, you can look it up instantly. You know, when I got Little Samson, and I'm fortunate, and believe me, I think I'm very fortunate to have this title. I didn't hunt for three months in order to save up that money in order to get it on purpose. I didn't want, you know, 50 or 60 other smaller, not lesser games, but I wanted that game in my collection. So I just saved for it instead of getting a few ones here and there, like every weekend, you know, instead of going out to the shops or flea markets. I just saved. I made that choice. It's like it's like anything. You're going through the years as each year passes fewer and fewer of them exist and that's just yeah. that's the reality of it and what i what i don't agree with though are people making the labels and people making um yeah you know like fake fake games and they're trying to pass it off as a real little samson or a real stadium events or whatever have you that i can't stand because i think above everything else that destroys the collecting community and and i think i should clarify just so that there's no misconception if you don't have the means to get these games then that's okay too i don't oh, of care you know what you think is worth this or that or what your collection is i'm not judging your collection against mine i buy things because i want them you know and, and i'm it, not and saying it's cool it, if you get that you know it, it, i'm not also saying that all these old games should be worth eight hundred dollars, and that's just the way it is. But sure, the reality of it is, is that they are old and they are 
quote unquote antiques now. And I think maybe that's just the way it is. I mean, even if look at the turbo graphic stuff now, it's outrageous. If you can even find the stuff out there, which is pretty hard to do now, you go on eBay for any turbo title, you're looking at like 15 to 20 bucks. Obviously, there's a lot to talk about and still explore with with collecting. I mean, we've really, you know, just scraped the surface. And I'm sure as we continue to do more and more discussions like this on GamerCast, uh, we'll get to the bottom of some of these hardcore issues. But uh, let's wrap it up here and call that a day, guys, for, uh, you, you know, yeah. for this little foray into the world of collecting and the different aspects. And I uh, just want to, again, thank everybody from the NES Club who's tuned in to listen. And... Uh, this is your kind of place to hear what the film explores in a more in-depth, extended collector's edition way, if you will. And we look forward to uh, discussing something again soon and sharing our opinions with you in the future. Thanks a lot, guys. We'll see you next time. Talk to you soon. <laughs>